All right, let's get it. This is Nap Nose Buffalo, and uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can already see the show looks a little bit different. Uh, Casey is not with us this week. Uh, don't worry, he is still alive and breathing. He is just not on the show. Uh, he has some baby stuff going on because as, as anybody who listens knows, he has a baby on the way. So he had a, a busy schedule this week, told him to take the week off, and uh, got Jeff to fill in his space. So Jeff, how's it going today? Good. I was I was only slightly mildly disappointed to hear you say Casey was still alive and breathing because uh, <laughs> I was I was just hoping the tiger may have taken him out already. As you can see, I'm wearing my tiger football shirt. I went with my Idaho State Bengal hat in full support of whichever tiger Casey draws. Uh, in the arena to take down. I am 100% behind the Tiger because, no, I don't think Casey can take a Tiger one-on-one even if if he uh, has a weapon on him. So I'm in full support of the Tiger. We're going to have to put another notch on my side of that argument because it's the right side of the argument to be on. I'm right there with you. I wanted his reaction, too, from the Tiger gear. I mean, this is a Bills Buffalo podcast, and I'm. It almost looks like the Cincinnati Bengals. So I wanted to get his reaction to see if he would have noticed. First of all, oh, I'm I'm sure you would have noticed that. I do think it's kind of funny that so this is obviously a Bills podcast when we decide to actually talk Bills, which is talk about sometimes bills. sometimes few and far between, uh, depending on the week. But we both we're wearing Falcons colors right now. Both of us we're just repping mm. the Falcons. So I, I I don't know. Sorry, I guess, but. It is a Bills show, so we're going to get into some Bills stuff. Um, One of the things that we were actually talking about beforehand was that the stadium, I believe, and I I actually missed this. We're recording on Tuesday. Uh, We record all the shows a little bit earlier in the week, so if something happened Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, this week, or I guess Yeah, we're not Rico. We can't just go live. Yeah, we, we, you know what? Three hours. The way I like to put it, we're we're just not good enough to go live, I guess. Um, I, we didn't we weren't given the privilege of going live but this is going to be out on youtube so people still get to look at our ugly mugs but the stadium 100 percent full capacity this year is that correct yeah buffalo fanatics just tweeted out about 15 20 minutes ago that highmark stadium i hate that name by the way uh, can <laughs> operate at full capacity with unvaccinated fans required to wear masks and that is uh, according to uh, one of the Buffalo reporters and the New York State Department of Health. So Highmark Stadium. And I was thinking about this the other day. A year with no fans. And I'm going to count the playoff games as being a part of that year with no fans because 6,500, even for us Bills fans, is not a lot, even though they made it sound full. But close your eyes. Picture yourself being in the stadium And when I was a season ticket holder, they were playing Thunderstruck to introduce the players. So put Thunderstruck in your mind right now. Mm -hmm. And Sean McDermott introduces the offense first. Guess who's getting introduced last on that first game against Pittsburgh? You 60,000 people going to go nuts for Josh Allen. Oh, yeah. When he gets introduced on that first game, that opening Sunday, uh, Pittsburgh coming into town, coming off an AFC championship game appearance. Josh Allen is going to get the loudest uh, cheer out of any Bills player in a long, long time when they finally introduce him in front of a full stadium. Oh, yeah. There we go. I just realized I totally forgot the light that keeps me actually so you can see it. But, yeah, no, right there with you. When they announced Josh Allen. You look a little better fuzzy. Do I? Ah, Well, it is, I'm, I'm it actually is joking. I'm, I'm, I'm joking. So it is what it is. You know what? It probably was better for YouTube if people couldn't really see my face. But you know what? If I'm going to be on YouTube, need, I want to be seen. You know, you'll need the light when uh, when it kind of time, comes time to grill the stash back come uh, early September. Yeah, we'll we'll have to see how that goes. Um, I'm not so sure that that's going to I don't know. That might not make a comeback. I so, so I was actually the- just recently looking back through some of the uh the posts about you know just the the promo post that, that the podcast puts out and it was so much worse than i remember it's like so much worse like i i don't know why my girlfriend decided to be seen in public with me i <laughs> i don't know why because like it was bad it was really bad and for some reason there was people who like they wanted me to keep it 
Why did you guys do that to me? I blame you know what? I blame you. I blame you. We were on a run. We were on a run. Actually, okay. the last time that we talked, we we had just the last time we had talked like this, we just lost to the Cardinals. And then we started the run right after we talked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, but when it comes to facial hair, um, myself, uh, I, I have the Landers baby face if I shave. And on another note, my head looks much smaller if I shave. So I like to keep that full beard going. The only time I'm really ever going to shave is if I get to uh, ref the Idaho High School Boys Basketball State Championships in Boise because they like their refs to be clean, clean shaven. But um other than that, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep the beard during the regular season football, refing basketball. I just I can't I, I can't do what you can do. I mean, my mustache just doesn't look as good when you when you have that full stash. You cannot say that what my mustache does is looking. Good. I just said it's, it with a straight not. face. And you, yeah, and you're a straight face liar. <laughs> There's it's not <laughs> so a good I, mustache. But, but so back to the Josh Allen thing though. Oh, no, let me ask I you a question wait. first. Okay. We're going to stay on this mustache for one more minute. When's the wedding date? You have a fiance. When's the wedding date? I don't have one set yet. We're working on that. We, we just okay, got engaged. Wait. Was it about a week ago at this point? Yeah, about a week ago at this point. It'll be two weeks okay. by the time the show comes out. So we're still working on getting a date set. Number one. Uh, New Year's Eve is already taken by my wife and myself, so that's out for you. Like that one, we've already claimed that one. That's our anniversary. Uh, number two, don't make it during football season. You'll probably regret it. If it's during football season, it won't be on a football Sunday. It would be on a Saturday. So we, we've already talked about stuff in spring, fall, summer. Winter's probably the last resort, to be honest. We like warm weather. We like nice weather. So if we can if we can get some nicer weather, we're gonna push for that. Okay. Okay. Back to the Josh Allen thing. What were you gonna say? What were you asking? I would love to be there the just week one. I've actually talked about oh. potentially going. So we're both out of state. We don't live yep. in New York State. Would you consider going for week one just to be there? Not not necessarily just for when they announced Josh Allen, just the entire thing in general to be back the first oh, fully yeah, for, back game. But for like, the entire thing, if I could yeah. go, I could if I could finally get my you know my portfolio to act the way I want it to and, <laughs> and do some trading and investing, I, I would have no problem with with going. But Idaho to New York State is a haul. First of all, even if you're flying, it's 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 a full day of flying. Um, but and not on many, top of that, uh, not many actually, direct flights. Not from Idaho Falls. <laughs> I mean, you're basically going from Idaho Falls to Salt Lake City, and that's or Denver. I, I could have, I could have flown to see and see. That was another thing that made me mad too. Was last year the Bills came out west four times. I probably could have made it to three of them realistically, mm-hmm. but just to be there for the season opener after the year and a half we've just had um, would absolutely be amazing. Uh, my season seats were in I think three thirty two. Row 22, seat 26 was mine. So if you're uh, listening out there and that happens to be your – yeah, it was 2007, 2008 were the last two years I had season seats. So uh, like halfway up the upper deck on the 35-yard line behind the Bills, they're actually perfect seats because you can see everything. Mm -hmm. Um, You can can even see uh, T.O.'s shiny head for for the (laughs) 09 season when I was there. but yeah, just to be there and just to come out of the, just watch him come out of the tunnel and hear that roar, uh, tailgating is going to be fantastic that day. Um, it's going to be rowdy, and oh, yeah. uh, it's it, Bills Mafia better take some water. I, yeah, they're probably going to want to just pass them. That's what you know what they should do. Just the first like couple thousand fans that get in the stands, we'll just give you a bottle of water. We're just gonna we're just yeah. gonna gift it to you because. People are going to need it that day. <laughs> it's going to be hot. So it's September 12th. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you, you're going to get one of those uh, late summer days. Um, you know, it, it, you might have a dip of weather right before that as September rolls in where it cools down to maybe 70s, 60s. And then that day, it's going to jump up to like 80, 85. I almost guarantee it just because it's opening day and Bills fans are going to be in the sun for the first game back. Oh yeah, how many over under on number of we'll we'll say overweight guys, drunk guys, shirtless 
that are shown on the broadcast that day. I'm going to put, I'll put the number oh, at, so shown, yeah, shown on the broadcast because the number is just going to be way too many to count if you're just there. But <laughs> yeah, shown yeah. on the broadcast, we'll say 15. I'd take the under. I think CBS, uh, CBS wouldn't want to off put too many viewers. So I, I would take the under, but, um, if, if you just count, if you're just counting, well, I mean, you're talking to a TV guy, so you get the Fair. one, you you get the one guy who is um, hairy and with the huge beer belly, and he's got the B painted on his chest, and like the announcer can just say that is largely representative of our attendance here today, <laughs> and that's <laughs> yeah. And just to be clear, we love those guys as Bills fans, oh, yeah. like seeing seeing those guys on the TV. That just gets you riled up if you're watching at home. You you feel mm-hmm. like you're there. You feel like you you know somebody. It's just a good connection when you see one of oh, those yeah. guys on on the TV. So well, and you yeah. always see. So like my fifth grade teacher uh, knew Bill's Elvis from way back in the oh, day really? when they were kids. Like or you see the uh, the chefs or the Bills brothers. Like you you know all of these guys mm-hmm. uh, and, and girls just from seeing them on the broadcast so consistently. So um, to see everybody back in that stadium, full capacity, uh, I feel really sorry for Pittsburgh. Oh, they're going to, I mean, they're going to get destroyed. I really hope that they play Renegade at some point. Maybe even the run out song. Yeah, I that thought would they be were hilarious if they did that for I the I thought they were going to do that. Last, I thought they were going to do that last year while the Bills were on offense just to just to dig at them yeah. a little bit, and then they didn't do it. And um, but there weren't so there know, weren't fans Renegades, in the stands for that. So it's I don't think it would have been as big of a thing if they had done it last year when they're because there was nobody there. If they do it okay, this so year if, when there's fans in the stands, I think that makes a complete difference because the fans are going to go crazy. Because most fans that are going to that game, they're going to know. Or somebody around them will know, like, oh, this is Renegade. Like, this is, quote, unquote, the Steelers song. No, it's not. It's the Bills song. We stole it two years ago. Tell that to your fiance. Oh, I, 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 th- it's going to be a rivalry. It already kind of is. When we, when we watched the game last year, I actually watched the game with her friends, who are, like, also my friends, but she went to high school with them. They're her friends. They're her friends, but... I, they're also my friends. Her, 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 yeah. You're required to make you, her friends your friends now. Just FYI. Oh no, it, yeah, it's it's a requirement. But I've also been around them enough at this point where it, they're definitely more her friends. But they're they're my friends too. But <laughs> no, they're all see, Steelers I, fans. So I was watching the game with them, and I actually tweeted out one a video of it. There's, I was, I think it was one of her friends was taking like a Snapchat or an Instagram story or whatever, and turns the video towards me. I wasn't even paying attention. I was just watching the game and I just look over. I'm like, your team sucks. And just kept watching mid video. It was perfect. Didn't know the video was happening. Nice. So there's, there's a rivalry there and I'm definitely not shy about it. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things about playing uh, renegade, first of all, renegade is an okay song. Um, it has an extra effect when you put it over stadium speakers at full blast and you have, you have thousands of people going nuts for it. But other than that, it's it's just an okay song. It would be un, very unprocessed like of Sean McDermott to actually do that because that shit yeah. if the Bills if the Bills met the Steelers in the postseason, that shit would be played over and over and over again by Mike Tomlin and the Steelers. The the fact that Sean McDermott did that and the Bills did that to them, you 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 don't want anything like that where you can get caught with your pants down, and that would be very unlike uh, Sean McDermott process team. I agree. I'm I don't like that you took the reasonable approach there though, because Sean McDermott's <laughs> going to do the same thing. He's going to think about those things because those are the types of oh, things yeah. that Sean McDermott thinks about at this point in the year. Like he was thinking about that two years in advance. Because he just – that's the way his mind works. He, so, yeah, no, I wish you didn't bring that up. I wish you didn't make me think about that too because the thought of them opening up with like when they're announcing everybody, all the starters, and they just got Renegade playing in the background, it would have been a spectacle. It would have been awesome. So thanks for killing yeah. the dream, Jeff. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. I am a dream <laughs> – I'm, I'm a dream killer. Just ask my wife. Um <laughs> I, I dreams are uh, they come here to die, so. <laughs> uh, 
You know what? That's a that's a tough place to be in then if you're the dream killer. Um, so, all right. So mm -hmm. we do have a topic. We're not just going to randomly talk about things back and forth. We actually had a planned topic. Now, I will say we talked about this beforehand. We planned very little out of this topic. Mm -hmm. We're doing top 10 this week, not drafting or anything like that. Just we each wrote down our top 10 most valuable players on the bills. We didn't discuss what deems a player the most valuable. So that's completely up for interpretation. I, How do you want to do this? I was kind of thinking I'll give my first one, okay. and then you give your first one and second one. Then I'll give my second and third. Because I, I think if we well, went 10 to 1, I think we all know who one is going to be. Number yeah, one. So I, I don't think yeah, that's as so, big of a deal. I think it would be better to kind of build the list out from there. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of people would understand why we chose Taron Johnson as number one. So, Oh, I was thinking Levi Wallace. Shoot. Yeah. Okay, oh, I guess we Levi, need to go okay, to Levi Wallace. Sorry. Yeah. See, hey, at least we ended up in the same room. <laughs> True. No, actually, you know what? Shout out Levi Wallace. I'm a fan of him. I don't care if other people are or not. Whatever. I am too. Levi yeah. Wallace, straight down, straight down I-15, Weber State University, about two hours from here. Um, would have covered him and Dame Lillard, both playing for Weber State when they come up to play Idaho State uh, when I was back in TV. So, all right, number one, both of us, uh, let's just say it at the same time, three, two, one, Josh, Josh Allen. Allen. Yeah. yeah, no, the right on. One there was never MVP, any doubt. Yeah. 10 to 1. So now we got one out of the way. We all know that. Uh, why don't you go with number two, Nap? Do we, do we want to talk about Josh Allen at all on this? Because I – so we actually came to this re revelation, re yeah, whatever revelation last week. Yeah, it was week. revelation. We hadn't talked about him at all until last week. This entire off season, which is mm -hmm. and then and then you had impressive. a radio host steal yeah. your steal your gig. He didn't know. He didn't steal it. He gave us credit. He actually did. He he named us, and I think okay. he might be coming on the show next week. So I'm I'm not gonna. I, I we were very appreciative that he actually okay. He okay. announced that he was gonna say it. he named us on the show and everything. He. So he gave us a shout out. He he did his his due process for it. We we respected that. Um, but yeah, that was very cool. But it was really weird to kind of come to that realization that like we have this starting quarterback who's really great, and now that we have that, we're we're just not really we talking talk about it because the focus is so much so on how can everybody else improve to get to the level that they need to be at. Because if he just has something similar to what he did last year, not even necessarily at that level. The yeah. Bills are still like he's still the best player on the team. So it, it was mm -hmm. well, weird to kind of realize that. We are Bills fans not talking about a quarterback. Oh, it feels just go good. Ahead. Just relax for a little it bit. It feels good. Yeah. Yeah. I need I need an I need a nice little iced tea. You know, I'm gonna <laughs> use my beer for the Kermit the Frog. There we go. You know, it's none of my business that the uh, other three teams in the AFC East Really, still have question marks at the quarterback there's been, visit. There's a lot of question marks. We, I mean, we can get into that just a little bit before we keep going with the list. But like, there was reports that and there was a fake report, and then there was a real report that Tua was struggling in practice. There's a couple of videos, and I know small clips don't show everything, but Cam Newton really looks bad. Mm -hmm. Like, really looks bad in the clips that I've seen. And there's not just one. There's a couple, but still, who knows? And then who knows what's going on? in that dumpster fire in New Jersey with all of their problems. So who knows, mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll go with my number two and I, I'm okay. just going to work my number two right off of the number one pick, because if your quarterback is your best player and you have a good left tackle, the next most valuable player in my opinion is the guy who's protecting his blind side. So I'm going with Deion Dawkins. And it's not necessarily because I think Deion Dawkins is the next best player on the team. It's not because I think mm -hmm. that his contract is the next best value because I think all of that can play into value, like a, just an overall player's value. But what he does for this team, if he's not on the roster, the Bills' offensive line looks completely different. There's a huge question mark and how do we protect Josh Allen? But Deion Dawkins is solid. Is he the best left tackle in the league? No, that's fine. He doesn't have to be. He does his job. He protects Josh Allen, and that like that saves the franchise so many headaches because if they don't mm -hmm. have a guy over there doing what Deion Dawkins does in the locker room, on the field, 
all of that, the team looks completely different potentially. So Deion Dawkins, in my opinion, outside of Josh Allen, he's the next most valuable player on this team. Okay. I, I like your very logic. How dare you use <laughs> logic and reasoning? We on try the and internet, stay away. Sir. We try and stay away from logic on this on this show usually. Well, but it felt like this might be the week to do Casey. it. Don't speak for Casey. He he stays away from logic and reasoning, but you you try to rein him in and it's hilarious trying to watch you hurt a cat. Yeah, it it does. We've acknowledged that both that like he's the one who he's going to get real off topic and you'll just see me be like I, but but let's let's bring it back. So you, you yep. see that every now and then. So you don't it seems like you don't necessarily agree that Deion Dawkins is the second most valuable player on the roster. No, I wrote I wrote down a different name and here's okay. why. And here's who it is. My number 2 MVP on the on the on the team is uh Poe as Jordan Poyer. Okay. He he is one of those guys. Uh, he led the team in tackles last year. Um and he's one of those guys who's going to lead by example. You hear about Micah Hyde, the other safety who's also on my list. Um being the leader of the defense, but Poe does so many more things. And and here's one of the reasons why I say that he's number two is because generally traditional football analysts will tell you you do not want your safety leading the team in tackles because it means that guys are just gashing your defense. They're getting through the first and second levels to get to the third level where the safety has to make the tackle. That's not the case with Poe. Poe is all over the field. He's in the backfield. He mm-hmm. can play. He can come up and play mid range. He can go deep and play with the best of them. And I think he is um, really one of the biggest cogs on that defense um, for the Bills. So I put him at number two. I, you know what? I can respect that pick. He's on my list, so I'll, I'll get to him later too. But yeah, I mean, when when he's on the field, it you can you know it makes a difference because if he's not there, like what he does is so vital to the defense because he has so many different positions that he can play out of and make an impact Mm -hmm. if he needs to he can be the deep guy that's not what they really want him to do the most he can be that that up in the box safety so he can be all over the place so i i I can get down with that pick you want to do your kind of uh, uh, i I bet i'm i'm almost guessing we had the same number three but you might be a little off if you're a little more traditional going that route i had stefan diggs at number three and i don't think that's what i went to also yep three was diggs um i'm gonna go ahead and let you explain it i don't think i need to explain why but bill's fans know Bills fans yep. know that he's one of the biggest reasons Josh had that that jump is because of his presence on the field, his his competitive nature, his route running, it stressed defenses, and Josh was still able to give him the ball. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, Josh Allen. I think Josh Allen was on a trajectory to improve this year or last year, whether he had Stefan Diggs or not. But it would have been nowhere near the improvement that he had if it was just John Brown, Cole Beasley, Gabriel Davis. If that was the wide receiver crew, I think Allen would have taken a step forward, but it would not have been that MVP level step forward that he took. Having the type of guy that Stefan Diggs is, who he was really undervalued in Minnesota. Like that is so much clearer than even when everybody was saying that when the trade happened. The Vikings just completely undervalued him in their offense. They did not give him the ball enough because it clearly when you give him the ball like the Bills did last year, he's going to just do nothing mm-hmm. but make play after play after play. We we talk about Cole Beasley and we had talked about John Brown being like that safety blanket for Josh Allen and they were but like not to the level like Stefan Diggs came in and he was immediately mm-hmm. that guy. No matter what was going on, you knew Josh Allen had the ability to just find Stefan Diggs and make a play. Mm-hmm. And it's because he's just that type of receiver where we're talking about, he might be one of the, the top three best wide receivers in the league. You look at rankings all over the place. People aren't hesitant now to be like, yeah, Stefan Diggs, whatever. If they want to rank him first, second, third, wherever it is, you're seeing that all over the place, all sorts of networks. They're giving him his mm-hmm. respect because he got his opportunity and he made a ton of plays. And it wasn't just that, like, he – I think I think that what is so great about 
him with Allen is that they both made each other better. Like they were both really good mm-hmm. players beforehand. I, I think they both like had that potential to take that next step, but the way they came in and just meshed Stefan Diggs made Josh Allen better. Josh Allen, yeah. the way he likes to play, he made Stefan Diggs better, but Stefan Diggs in that wide receiver room, you can just tell there's a, it's totally different between what he can do and what everyone else can do. And we have already talked really highly about everybody mm-hmm. else. So Stefan Diggs, he's just and, that and, next level. And one of the things I like about the two is I think right away, I think each of them, it was mutual. They saw the talent in the other one. Stefan Diggs coming out of out of having Kirk Cousins as his quarterback saw what Josh Allen could do. Mm-hmm. And I think that may have motivated Diggs just a little bit better. So oh, I got a I got a quarterback who can throw to me and who will throw to me. And then they talked about how each of them could freelance. Josh doesn't want me to run precision routes. Um, he, you know, I can break it off and he's on the same page as I am. Or if he's scrambling and then I can just find a release point for him. It doesn't have to be so precise. Um, when you have like a quarterback like Matt Barkley who has to throw with timing and mm-hmm. precision, it's, it's not like that with Josh Allen. And I think, um, you know, they say real recognizes real right off the bat, right after that trade. I think each of them were like, okay, like we're going to, we're going to work with this. And, and no matter what happens, we're going to work everything out. And that's that chemistry happened right away. Yeah. And you, I mean, you saw it not only just with Allen wanting to get digs the ball, but Allen have Allen having the trust to mm-hmm. give digs those 50, 50 balls that you, we really didn't see that before where it was just like, Oh, I'm in trouble. Let me put it up to my best guy. Because before, like if Allen was in trouble, he'd put the ball up. He, had, he never had a problem with that. But it, it, we didn't know who it was going to go up to. If Allen's in trouble yeah. now and he kind of puts that ball up for a 50-50 ball, 90% of the time, 95% of the time, you know it's digs on the other end because Allen just trusts him, and he should because he, he catches everything. We saw the catch against Miami week two, mm-hmm. the catch against Oakland – or sorry, Vegas was at week four, I think, and then time and time and time again after that. The Cardinals game that should have been the game winner. Like it just constantly kept happening. If Allen's in trouble, who's going to bail him out? Stefan Diggs. Yep. Okay. Give yep. me your number four. We're snaking this. Give me four. Yep. My number four, I went with Tredavious White. Hey, man. Great minds think alike. I also picked Trey Day at number four. Um, man, I must have a thing for defensive backs. I don't know. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna give a heads up. I do have a run on defensive backs right now, so we'll, we can get into the rest of the guys later. But I mean, Tre'Davious White. What uh, what more do you need to say about him other than he is locked down? He does what like he. I know he doesn't travel the field, but he locks down his side. Like there's a reason that we are always complaining about the other cornerback in the defense, no matter who it is. Since Trey White's been there, and I know the other cornerbacks haven't been great. They've been okay, but we're always complaining about them because the quarterback doesn't want to throw near Trey White because he's he's yep. going to make a play. He's locking down his guy. He's going to bat the ball down. He's going to pick it off, whatever. He's there to make a play, big play Trey. Uh, yeah, what, what more do you need to say about him? He, he's always – he's just – he's always been good since he got to Buffalo. There, there have been people who have been saying, oh, Trey wasn't that good last year, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, if you think that wasn't that good, um, your expectations of him are now quite lofty. Um, if, if that was a down year for him, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Uh, because he still played really freaking well. Not to mention that, um, like you kind of been saying, cornerback number two might be get a shot at the Pro Bowl because they're going to have a lot of tape this upcoming season. And fans are fans are going to be able to see him. Coaches will be able to see whoever is cornerback number two. And um, quite honestly, if Levi Wallace could stay on the field and beat out another guy for another year, Levi Wallace might have a shot at the Pro Bowl because of Trey Davies White. Just simply for the fact that it doesn't matter who Trey is guarding, he is going to stop them more often than not. Like the, They mm-hmm. want to play their best guys away from Tredavious White. Every offense is going to want to do that because they know they have a better shot if he's not around their best player as opposed to if somebody else is. And mm-hmm. I think it's as simple as that. 
Okay, number five, I'm taking Micah Hyde at okay. number five, another defensive back. Um, safety, we talked a little bit about him uh, earlier being the leader on the defense. I think um, he's that veteran presence, um, but we see it on, on on the field with his play. I think he's kind of that silent assassin. Um, having a strong safety duo like that as well, um, I think Poe kind of is the loud one, visibly, maybe visually, he's the mm-hmm. loud one. And but Mike, they just underrate Micah Hyde so much. And just just on that, I'm putting him at number five. And that's fair. So I'm actually just going to do this in tandem because I have Jordan Poyer at five and then Micah Hyde at number six. And I felt like they had to be right around each other because that's just the way they work. Like they work best when they're together. Mm-hmm. So the fact that we are able to have the entire, I guess, three-fourths of the secondary on this list in, in the top six for both of us, because I have it in the top six, you have it in the top five, I think that's mm-hmm. incredible. That speaks volumes for what Sean McDermott has been able to build and Brandon Bean they've been able to build. But those two together, I mm-hmm. it just it baffles me how constantly over and over and over again you see lists come out, whether it's PFF, whether it's ESPN, whoever they put out top safeties or top safety duos and they constantly leave these two guys off the list. But if you, if you listen to what other players around the league say, they always value them higher than a media outlet will. Cause these guys just are, mm-hmm. they're always in the right spot. They play off of each other really well. They're interchangeable. Like they're, they're quite possibly the perfect kind of tandem to have in this bill's defense. When you have, the way they work together, the way they communicate. They're the total package. And they're great separate, but they're even better together. I think Bill Belichick was the one who said uh, planning for those two is so hard because you never know where they're actually, it could have been Tom Brady as well. It, both of them may have Their said this. Their pre-snap movement. Um, I think they were, yeah, I think they talked about yes, the pre-snap movement. Yes, they were talking movement. about pre-snap movement because they they never end up where they start. Mm-hmm. You know, you have a lot of guys who won't who won't move pre snap, and they're going to um, they're going to basically give their cards away on how they're playing pre snap. But pre snap movement, if Bill Belichick and Tom Brady are saying these two are really hard to read, that says a lot about them. Yeah, and then I mean, just speaking of value, we haven't really talked about like actual contracts much, but they're they're. Pretty oh. valuable contracts. Like they're they're both mm-hmm. getting paid about the same money. It's roughly 10 mil a year. And when you're a really good safety, when you're one of those top tier safeties, like I, I think uh Tyron Matthew is getting like 15, 16 mil a year. Uh, like those top tier safeties get paid. And these guys, the value that they have, I know they're a little bit older, they're probably towards the or coming close to the end of their prime, but the value that they get off the play on the field combined with their contract just incredible value for both of them. Well, and they were both McDermott's first signings when he yeah. came in. He he yeah. went right after those two guys when he came in. And I think uh, that move is maybe what helped get him extended himself, McDermott, on top of yeah. getting new contracts or extensions, at least for Poe and Hyde. And if we want to be honest, I mean, he, he kind of took a shot with both of them because it's not like Micah Hyde was looked at as this – incredible player when he was in green Bay, like he was good, but I think there was definitely some chatter when he got signed of like, Oh no, the bills, they, they overpaid for him. And Poyer was coming off of his, uh, was it the, the kidney laceration or whatever he had? He had something, something happen when he was in Cleveland. He had a lot of injuries when he was in Cleveland. He had a really bad one that kind of took him out for a while. And I mean, they, they, people thought that he, they might've overpaid for him even because, they gave him a, a multi-year, like a three or four year deal. And it's paid dividends at this point to have both mm-hmm. of them on the roster. So I, I yeah, you can't you can't go wrong having either of them on this list. So I get those are that's my six. Who was your sixth? Uh my six was a guy you already named when that was Deion Dawkins. Okay. Um like again, you said it, keeping him upright, keeping Josh Allen upright. Mm-hmm. Um is one of the most important tasks for a football team, keeping your quarterback, your star, uh, keeping their star's ability to make those plays. Um, and, you know, and it was just a few years ago when Sean McDermott first came in that uh, he kind of had this system with veteran, 
and the young guys. And as we've watched those young guys, the, the veterans, you know, the Kyle Williams kind of fade off and, and kind of leave the Bills. Um, well, that was planned because now here come the young guys. Deion Dawkins is now the veteran. Yeah, yeah. And he can he's going to help those other two tackles that we drafted, um, Spencer Brown and um and Tommy Doyle that that we took this year. Um just having him with his personality now step into that leadership role on the offensive line. Um, yeah, he's definitely definitely inside my top ten. Yeah, and and he's I mean, speaking of just his leadership also. He's not a guy who's getting in trouble off the field, which is huge when you talk about a guy who's going to be a centerpiece for the team. Like he, You never hear anything bad about him. In the locker room, outside of the locker room, it doesn't matter. Everybody just has glowing things to say about Deion Dawkins. And he seems, I mean, he seems like a guy who would be so much fun to just hang out with, oh, have a beer with. I'd yeah. love to get the chance to do that. Yeah, just hang out, have a beer, um, eat some wings or something, just and just kick it. Like I bet he is a riot. Um, oh, yeah. just just making jokes and all that stuff. Definitely go to a barbecue with Dion, Dion and the guys, man. Yeah, um, that'd be a lot of fun. Give me your give me your number, is it seventh now we're on? We're we're on we're on number seven. And speaking of young guys be coming into the leadership roles. This guy is the center of the defense. He's going to be a leader. A lot of Bills Mafia have knocked him uh, undeservedly. Uh, I think they forget how young he is. They forget he was coming off an injury. Um, but it's Tremaine Edmonds. Okay. He's a first-round draft pick uh, who has been an anchor on the defense. Now, you say, I, I've got his... I've got his uh, his uh, linebacking partner next to him. If if you wanted to go with Poe po and uh, Hyde right next to each other, I actually went number eight, Matt Milano. So seven and eight, I have Tremaine Edmonds and Matt Milano because this defense really, uh, until last year, was the center of the team, and they're the center of the defense. And I, you know, I think Josh Allen and a bunch of the other guys definitely are more valuable. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it just as far as talent, but these guys are rock solid, um, dependable guys in the middle of that defense. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't hate that. That's kind of similar to like how, like you said, I, I have my the Bills defense, the way they kind of built around having two really strong safeties. McDermott's defense is all it's always been built around having two really good athletic linebackers. It was that way in Carolina. He's trying to do it again right now by being able to build up Tremaine Edmonds and Matt Milano. I don't have Edmonds on this list. So I, I don't I honestly I don't know whether people are gonna like that better for me or you when when we put this out. I really don't know because he's been such a hot topic. And me not having him on the list has nothing to do with the fact like I think he's a good player. I think he can really develop into a great player because he has all of the, the athletic skills. He has the athletic ability. He has the size. He has the speed. He has what you want. I still want to see a little bit more from him consistently, but like he makes plays. He gets knocked for doing mm-hmm. things because he doesn't play like it's the 90s anymore. He doesn't, you know, crush people for every single tackle. Sometimes when he makes a tackle, he gets driven back. Yes, he, he still misses too many tackles. He needs to he needs to get better on that. But being the centerpiece of the defense at what 22, I think he is. Mm-hmm. That's incredibly difficult. Most guys are still in college at that age. So what yep. he's been able to do coming into the league at 19, still developing like a, as an athlete, yeah, I, I, I have no problem with him being on your list. I did, didn't put him on mine. I do have Milano on the list. Milano was my next guy. And it's because there's a noticeable difference when Milano is on the field versus mm-hmm. off the field. It might just be... It, it might be like a random thing where the Bills just don't play as well against certain teams, but when he didn't play last year, I'm pretty sure he missed the three games the Bills lost. I could be wrong about that, so don't quote me. But I yeah, think, they missed, I think he missed the, the top three games head. that the Bills lost. I know there was at least two of them he missed. He missed the first two where it was Tennessee, Kansas City. I know he missed those. I can't remember mm-hmm. if he missed the game against Arizona or not. Either way. The Bills play better when he is in the defense. 
all of the statistics show that. And I'm not a real big statistic guy. Like I, I can read them all why? if I have them, but all of the statistics that I see on Twitter go to somebody else for them. They're going to be able to explain them better, but they show that Milano, when he's on the field, the Bills' defense, all of the numbers are better. Why use stats and facts to back up an opinion? I mean, come on. No, I know, I know. Why would I want to do that? That's that's way. Why too would logical. you want to do that? It's it's, I, it's I, that, way you know too what that much goes work. with. That well, yeah, yeah. That kind of goes with we didn't prep this very much. Like we were just like we're gonna do this list. You decide your list. I'll decide mine. We'll come together. And at eight fifty five, I I texted you and I was like, hey, we're, we're still doing this, right? We're good. And then we hopped yeah. on. And we started recording. So that's the the amount of this prep work. But I can tell you when I when I look at this Bills defense, the guy who I want to make sure is in that linebacking crew. Even before Edmonds, because I think Milano is a little bit better in coverage and he's just all over the field, I would I would take Milano over Edmonds, but Edmonds is right there. Like it was really difficult for me to not have him on this list. Yeah, and kudos to Big Baller Bean for getting him back in the building. And I think, you know, I said during last season that we as Bills fans, if we're going to attach ourselves to Brandon Bean. We can't really attach ourselves to a lot of our draft picks. And I mm-hmm. thought that Matt Milano was going to be the very first one where we went through draft, develop, aren't able to resign. I thought yeah. I thought for sure that we were probably not going to be able to to resign him, um, that he was going to go get more money. But that's on Sean McDermott for helping to keep that that team, that environment that guys want to play for. They can look at other big money contracts and say, yeah, but your 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 clubhouse sucks. Like your your head co- your head coach is an author- authoritarian, if I can say that right. Uh, <laughs> you you aren't winning. I've had a little bit too much New Belgium coming into the authoritarian. Um, your head coach is a little too powerful. Uh, you're not winning a lot. You get you're giving me a lot of money, but I just look better in red, white, and blue, and I like the wings too much and. Um, I'll take just a little bit less to stay with Sean McDermott and make a run with it. That's credit to to McDermott and Bean right there. Yeah, I was I was right there with you. Actually, I formulated an entire show before the start of the season with Judge around your favorite guy, Judge. Uh, around oh, he is who are the guys favorite. that who like who out of the Bills draft picks are going to be the first one that they're not able to draft, develop, and resign because we we're just starting to come up on that time and. Teron Johnson was one of the guys that we had picked out for that because whether it was going to be because he just hasn't played perfectly all the time, like he hasn't played well enough consistently or the money side of things, whatever, he was one of them. But Milano was one that we really struggled with. And at the end of the day, we were like, look, we just don't foresee there being enough money to go around where when you put it all in at the end of the day, he might not fit. But Brandon Bean found a way to make him fit financially, and we know he fits mm-hmm. on the defense. So kudos to Bean, and I'm I'm glad to see Milano around. Now you you bring up Judge, and I, I so <laughs> on on these broadcasts or these uh, webcasts, and on and on Twitter, I'm constantly, constantly, constantly going after two guys, Casey and Judge, and it's why is because I feel kindred spirits to them, and if I'm I'm a ball buster. Mm-hmm. And those two make it so easy. Like if I were okay, so I'm a ball buster, and if I were a sniper, Casey would be a clown running through the field holding red balloons. <laughs> like it would just be too easy. And then Judge, you know, he's he he's just right there with them. Like you just make it you make yourself such an easy target. And I'm such a ball buster. I'm just gonna dig and dig and dig and dig. And I thought Casey actually wasn't going to come on tonight because um he, he didn't want me to embarrass him just a little bit. <laughs> He's gonna love hearing that. Now yeah, they you know what? Casey and I have talked about this a couple times that sometimes it you just have to take your shots when they when they arise. And that's yep. the way it is. And, and, and you and always one of so the, I will say it was very interesting when you kind of like joined the team in the season. I think one of the first shows you did, you came in hot taking shots at Judge. 
And at first I was like, whoa, wait, wait a second. Like this was, you came in real hot, not because I felt like the need to defend him or anything like that. I'll take my shots yeah. at judge too. But like, you were just like, I, I just don't care. This is, this is cool. He can take the shots. We'll, we're going to do this and I'm just going to go at him. And it makes for good. Like it's entertaining when people are able to do that. Again, TV guy of 10 years. Um, you can't really do that stuff on true television um <laughs> when you when you're when you're trying to just run through highlights um and, and you just i i really don't like drama that much especially local drama if you know a mom gets mad because you pronounced her son's name right on the or wrong on the highlight it's just it's just i don't like that stupid type of drama but on the internet it's a hell of a lot of fun and judge can take the punches. Casey can take the punches. And that's what I really ultimately want is I want to know you guys can roll with me when times get tough. Like I want to know you guys can take the punches and it's kind of process worthy to, to do those things. I mean, I have a friend who was, uh, uh, I don't know. He, he wasn't high ranking army, but he, he was, was army and overseas. And, um, he says, don't let anybody in the army ever know what gets under your skin because your brothers will exploit it to no end just for their own entertainment. Oh, I bet. And, yeah. Hey, so and, and it's speaking, almost, of, speaking of just like being able to dish it and take it, have you, have you seen, uh, we talked about this on the podcast with him last week. Have you seen like producer Kendall just taking shots at both me and Casey from the podcast account? No, I have not. Yeah, no, he's just all about it. He loves anonymously. Like, he'll never do it from his own account, but he loves just anonymously taking shots at us. Like, I think the the example that I – one of the examples last week, and then he went back and did it again right afterwards, was there – I think Bruce Exclusive put something out about, you know, doing a solo pod. And Kendall logs on, and he's just like, well, Kyle couldn't do a solo pod by himself. Sad. Because, you know, I used to do a solo pod. Now I don't anymore. It's difficult, uh, not going to lie. But Kendall's just like, yeah, I love, he loves taking shots at people too. But you know what? It's fun. It's funny. I got to admit. Are, are you, are you ready to announce to the world that you stole Kendall from Air Raid Hour? No, we had, it, we had him first. We had him first. The, the timeline will show that we had him first. He's just, he's embarrassed of us. What can I say? We we fleshed it all out on the, on the show last week. I think he's I think he's just on our side now. We, like we have a yeah. mole inside the air raid hour. Don't tell anybody. So Ooh. yeah. Well, you know, you say mole and air raid hour. I immediately go to tilt because tilt is so sneaky and quiet. He's almost like ratatouille. Um, that that I would just yeah. think that it's that it's tilt. Well, I mean, look, if we were gonna, you know what? If we were gonna be able to turn one of tilt ver- or judge against us or against the other one, I, I think it'd be easier to, I think it'd be easier to turn judge, but I think tilt was doing okay. a better job of hiding it because I think he might I wanna, be a I want to discuss this. I want to discuss this a little bit uh, further on down, down the line in, in this podcast. Okay. Um, we'll come back to it. But let, let's, let's finish when well, we got sidetracked here um, <laughs> from our list, but we're at the bottom of the list. So I don't think we have to go right. too in depth. Are, are we um, you're at number eight now? I'm at number eight. I gave my number. I gave not my number eight is Matt Milano. Your okay. number eight is uh, my number is, eight. Um, I so I I got a little maybe a little weird with this. I don't know. I went with Tyler Bass though because I think the special teams is really important. I think it, it's extremely underrated with most fans. And when I was thinking about like, so th- think about who scores the most points for a team. It's the kicker. The kicker always scores the most points for the team. Tyler Bass, I think he set a team record last year for the most points by a, a Bills kicker. He hit that that game winner, the eventual game winner against the Colts in the playoffs from, what, 54 yards? I think that ended up being the game sealer. Like, the Bills already had the lead, but, like, he came through in the clutch. I know he had his moments where he struggled at the beginning of the year. People weren't really that high on him, but he really found his confidence. He found that clutch, and he – I mean, he mm-hmm. just bombs the ball, and it's it's usually it going through the uprights. So having a kicker who you can rely on when you're farther out, you're past forty yards out, even because like before mm-hmm. he was there, we we weren't kicking field goals if it was more than like a forty-five yard field goal. With Tyler Bass, mm-hmm. you got the confidence to kick from 50, 55, 
maybe more than that even like that mm -hmm. does wonders for how you go about approaching second down third down depending on where you're at on the field having a kicker who you just know can put the ball through the uprights i i think what tyler bass is going to bring to this team hopefully for years to come just the consistency is going to be awesome so i, I think i i put uh, him right up there like way up there on value for the team I, I really debated putting a special team teamer in there. Um, I, I, I looked at Reed Ferguson, um, team captain, uh, honorable mention for, for this for this list. But, um, you know, I guess I just am not one of those guys who uh, who was going to go with a special teamer on, on this That's list. Fair. That's fair. It's not it, – it, I mean, it's, it's not a like a sexy type of pick where – like no. you look at it and you're like, yeah, love that. That's awesome. But, I mean, have you when seen you think about it once again in those logically. shorts? <laughs> yeah. When when you think about it logically, though, and once again, this is not a show that really likes to use numbers and logic, as you can tell, because I've just said the stats. I haven't given the actual numbers because I don't have the numbers in front of me right now. I, I'm sitting at my desk and there's literally nothing in front of me. I have my phone that has my list. That's it. But what Tyler Bass does what, for the team is great. When you say there's nothing in front of you, are you talking about your future or what? Yes. Oh, yeah. No, I darn, I sorry. don't have much, I don't have much going for me. Yeah. Hey, yeah, you got a, a great fiance. place to be. Yeah, you know what? I have, I have a lot a going for me in the personal life. Yeah. 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 <laughs> she'll she'll never hear that. It's okay. She doesn't listen. She'll to never. She she's a Steelers <laughs> fan. Why would she listen to this? <laughs> All right, uh, my my number nine. Uh, unless you want to do number one, my number nine was Cole Beasley, and um, same thing. He, nine. He was my he number had nine. The second, he had the second most targets, and uh, he even had a catch percentage that was a tenth of a percent better than Diggs. So uh, you want to move those chains? Let's get that first down. You're going to Cole Beasley. Um, you talk about a safety blanket earlier in the segment. Uh, ultimate safety blanket for Josh Allen. With those beautiful blonde locks that flow. Yeah, dude, um, the flow was incredible last year. He should be a hockey player with that flow. Yeah. So I, I think the difference when it when you're talking about the safety, the safety net for Josh Allen, if you're if you're looking more than like five or ten yards down the field, that's where the safety net pretty much automatically becomes Stefan Diggs. Anything closer than that, Cole Beasley's like he's not gonna have anyone within five yards. You ever like mm -hmm. have you ever just watched the highlight clips of him, whether it's his time in Dallas or in Buffalo, where he kind of does like the whole Stevie Johnson shake on his route? Mm -hmm. Goes a couple yards out, does a little shimmy shake, acts like he's going one way. He just he stops on a dime and turns so quickly that the guy mm -hmm. cannot stay with him. If you want a, a five yard out, Cole Beasley's your guy. If you want a slant route, Cole Beasley's gonna be your guy. Because if he just makes that little shimmy move, the defender's not there when he's done. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I got two more points on Beasley. First of all, when he went back to Dallas in 2019 and he gets into that end zone on, on that first touchdown and you hear uh, Jim Nance go, Beasley, back. I wanted him so bad to <laughs> jump into the, uh, the change bucket, the Salvation Army change bucket. The, I was like, mm -hmm. jump in it jump in it oh he didn't jump in it but um and then also maybe we should give him extra credit for this and bump him up one or two but he is an awesome rapper like yeah. go to itunes yeah go to amazon music whatever you have and just look up cole beasley and listen to a few of his top rated songs and they're pretty damn good he's for saying, he's good. having to for having to put in a full-time job as a football player if he's just doing that kind of on the side during the off season. Um, that's, that's pretty damn good. Yeah. I mean, look, it, I will say it's, it's not on uh, the, the why so serious mixtape level for me. I, I liked what Stevie Johnson put out when he was there, that one, the one mixtape that he put out, I will say I still have that on, on my phone, but the music, I mean, yeah, he's got some, he's got some talent. He's got some skill. I liked, I like Cole Beasley's music and you know what? He knows how to catch the football too. So hey, that's not, a, a, win, not a bad win. combo. Yeah. Yeah. I'm fine. If we look, if we want to bump him up one for me, it's going to bump Matt Milano down and Tyler Bass down potentially. Cause I think I would put, I think I might have to bump him up two spots if I'm going to move him. Cause for the rap. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I, I'm gonna leave it the way it is. He's gonna stick with number nine for me. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bump anyone else down because I actually did put some time into thinking about where I put people. Just didn't put a whole lot of thought about the the logic behind you, why you I put did a it. lot of so so you put a lot of time thinking, just not a lot of thought. Yeah, that's a better way to put it. Yeah. I put a lot of maybe it just took me a lot of time to think. Like I didn't I didn't put the okay. effort into thinking. It just took me a lot of time to be like yeah, okay, this is this is what I want. Um, you know what? Yeah, I'm a slow so, thinker. Over the weekend, I think it was uh was it Leston of uh the the BF family. We were in the BF family chat and uh he goes, uh maybe it was uh sports rock uh said I was thinking and Leston got in there with the next comment uh, on the Twitter chat, rookie mistake. <laughs> it looked thinking if that was, was a rookie mistake. If that was Saturday, I was not in the chat. Well, yeah, if it was Saturday, I was not in the chat. Um, my Saturday. number 10. Let's let's do your number 10. I want to leave my okay. number 10 for last because I have a very okay. – I'll just say I have an interesting number 10. I, You know what? I think I do as well, and I, and I think it's because I'm lazy and it was a cop-out. And for number 10, I put Ed Oliver slash Mario Addison slash Jerry <laughs> Hughes uh, in, in at number 10 because they are such good players – but their the rotation is so heavy that that Sean McDermott and Leslie Frazier like to use that um, you can't just go with one of them. I mean, they were not among the team leaders in tackles, uh, yeah. and and AJ Klein of all people was up there with Mario Addison to tie for the team lead in sacks. So um, if 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 either one of those guys spent more time on the field than the other one. I think you would see it in the statistics, but the the defensive line rotation was so heavy that I, I definitely went with the cop out. Ed Oliver, Mario Addison, Jerry Hughes at number ten. That is very much a cop out. I'm going to make you pick one. You have to pick one of the three because we're, I'm putting this out as a list of ten. I I can't put all three in there. I get what you're doing because it is that rotation. Now that's a cop rotate, out, but you have to pick one. And I will say, um, none of them are my number 10. So none of them made your top 10 list? No, they're, they're honorable mention. I mean, Mario Addison um, was nowhere close. Yeah, you just eliminated one of them for me. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you know what? I, I, I got I to go. I got to go with Jerry. That okay. run back touchdown uh, was amazing. And I still think he should have left. I think it was Taron johnson who was running the correct way to pick up that fumble in denver and jerry hughes was turned and facing the wrong end zone when he picked up that ball and in that split moment i was like why did you pick it up why did not why did you not let taron took him a second to get up and, 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 and then and then he picked it up and turned around and ran it in for the end zone I'm like i was one of those no 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 okay okay yes 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 type plays mm -hmm. and um uh so i think i gotta go with jerry hughes being that leader type to to surplant the other two as number 10 yeah so J jerry hughes not a guy who gets a ton of sacks um which is really mm -hmm. odd because he's actually over the i think the last three years he's the postseason leader in sacks which you would not expect that that'd be a really good trivia question that i, I don't think almost anybody would get however he's always there he doesn't miss time i didn't even realize this it's actually been uh sports rock People would know him by that on Twitter, but he's he's really been pounding the table hard recently of like, do not undervalue what Jerry Hughes brings. Whether he's bringing the numbers or not, he is consistently making an impact because he's always there. I think he's only missed yeah. like a couple games throughout his time in Buffalo. Maybe, I mean, that, that might even be, he might not even have missed more than like two or three, I think, but he's just always playing. And when he plays... He's getting after the quarterback, whether he's forcing the quarterback to roll out or he's actually forcing the quarterback to step up and make a different play. Like he's still around the ball if he's not getting the sacks that we want to see. I would love to see him be able to finish those and, and up those sack numbers. But for what it's worth, like he is a very good player. He is extremely valuable to this defense. And I think now that the Bills have put some extra resources into the defensive line i think we might see those numbers take like a slight jump not like a big jump to where he's in double digits but i think when you see him with somebody opposite him 
who's doing similar things that can make plays consistently. And now if they have Epinesa in year two, Mario Addison probably going to fall off a little bit, but still going to be in the rotation. We know he can still make something happen every now and then. But then you get some of the other young guys in there who are going to help out with that rotation, whether they're making plays all the time or not, just helping out with that rotation. I think we might see a little bit, a little bit of an increase in that statistical production from Jerry Hughes. But whether we do or don't, he's always making an impact. Okay, give me your number 10. All right. My <laughs> my this number is a cop ten. out, isn't it? No, no, it's not. No, I I think I I think it's not going to play well with people when I when we put out the the graphic of it. But my number ten is Mitch Trubisky. Ooh. I can understand where you went with automatically. That you, you like I don't even have to explain why because it it's, it it does have to do with the fact that Trubisky is he a superstar? Not even close. We all know that. We don't want him to be Mm -hmm. the starting quarterback. But I am so much more confident in this Bills team if Allen gets hurt this year as opposed to last year. If Allen were to miss time last year, that would have been detrimental. If he misses time this year, obviously that's bad. But it's, it's a whole lot easier to deal with if he misses a month of time this year where you have Trubisky stepping in as opposed to Matt Barkley stepping in because Trubisky... Though we know he's not great, he he does play a similar style or he tries to play a similar style of a game to Allen. Doesn't have all the same abilities, but he is mobile. He can move around. He can make plays on the yeah. run. So he can fill in a lot better than anyone else. And having that good backup quarterback, it's something we didn't think that we were going to be able to afford. So then you throw in the fact that he can play, a, he tries to play a similar style game. He's been a starting quarterback. But then he took, was two point five million dollars to be the backup when guys like Tyrod mm-hmm. were getting ten mil and like other backup quarterbacks were getting five, six, seven mil, and he chose to take two point five to come to Buffalo. I, it's you could argue so many other people to be in that tenth spot, but I think for me that the value of knowing that your quarterback room is set if there's an injury for a little bit, I think that's that's a peace of mind that you didn't expect that we're, the Bills were going to have this year. Yeah. Most teams who, you know, go out and sign quarterbacks, they're going to have a backup as a starter. We yeah. have the reverse. We have a starter as a backup. And uh, on the air raid hour earlier this year, we went through the quarterbacks. And they put up this graphic of who were, who were that we were trying to rank the quarterbacks that we were playing. And I said, guys, put that graphic back up. And where would you put Mitch Trubisky among the quarterbacks that we that were playing, let alone Josh Allen? Like, I think Mitch Trubisky could come in and win us 11 games if needed. If, yeah, if he if needs to win us 11 games, he could with the talent on this roster, with the coaching staff. It's not on him. Uh, I think he'd be a lot more comfortable than he was in Chicago where he was getting run over by bus tires all the time. Yeah. Um, I, I just think it's a it's a better situation for him, and he could he could win us 11 games if need be. Yeah, and I get it. If people hate that I put him there because he's just nowhere near a top 10 player for the team, that's fine. I don't care. The peace of mind, the value that you get of having a good second string quarterback, I I I will okay. always take that because you I mean you could argue Jerry Hughes, you could argue Ed Oliver, you could argue Tremaine mm-hmm. Edmonds, who I didn't have on the list, you could argue Daryl Williams, you, like you could argue so many other players. You could pro, like some people could potentially make the argument of Star being on the list because of what you lose if he's not there. Like you could make mm-hmm. an argument for all of that, but give me the peace of mind with a $2.5 million backup contract when guys like Case Keenum made a three-year $16 million deal. That matters to me. And that's why we didn't talk about what defines value for each guy. I think the value that that Trubisky brings, it's different than what some of the other guys bring because he doesn't bring the value in his talent level the way other guys do, but he brings it because he's not really – he's taking up nothing out of the salary cap. Like – very hmm. little. So his value is everything combined with, and I keep saying it, the peace of mind that you have. If Josh Allen goes down, you're okay because you have somebody who's had that starting experience there. 
Yep. I, you know what? I completely agree. Um, now, here's a hypothetical for you. Okay. Extremely, extremely hypothetical surrounding your number 10, Mitch Trubisky. Uh, hypothetically, um, Josh Allen goes down week one against Pittsburgh. Mitch Trubisky comes in, Bills win the Super Bowl. You still, you still letting him walk after one year? Yeah. Yeah. I don't blame yeah. you. I, I think everybody still in Bills Mafia is, is there with you. Because and and my thought process on that is if if he can do it, then Josh Allen definitely can do it. Because Josh Allen is so much more talented than mm-hmm. Trubisky is, and we've seen that. But like you said, with the with the offense, with the weapons, with everything else, that can really elevate what Trubisky could do. Now, just to be clear, we don't want to see Trubisky play. We don't want to see him play other like I would love to see him play five, six minutes left in the fourth quarter, put him in because the Bills are up by 20 every single game. I'd love that. I don't he can play, play he can play both games against the Jets. Okay. Like both <laughs> games against the Jets. It'll be it'll be it'll be uh two by extra bye weeks built in for Josh Allen. Just hey, Mitch, right now. It's June. Just know you're playing against the Jets. No matter what happens, those two weeks you're playing against the Jets. Yeah, yeah. I would. I wouldn't hate that. Just give the the Bills a little bit extra of a challenge. It'd be interesting. Um, all right. So that that is the that is our top ten most valuable players for the Bills in 2021. Who knows? Maybe this list could be changed by the time the season starts because somebody else gets added or. Maybe so, there's trades or whatever. Who knows how everything could play out? I don't expect anybody who we put on this list to get traded or anything like traded, that. But no. I mean, it would it would be something crazy. But I, you'd literally never know. So I, the, I guess anything thing, is possible. Kevin Garnett, anything is possible, but not in an excited way. Yeah. The only thing I could see happening would be to 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 this list would maybe we pick up Zach Ertz and then he slides into somewhere into the the. Eight, nine, ten range. Um, See, for me, I wouldn't. I, but then, I wouldn't even put him there because I, I wouldn't yeah. have him as more valuable than Cole Beasley, and he's not. So he's not no. gonna. He's not gonna do that. And then, I don't think the Bills' offense uses tight ends enough for it to. I think it would have to be the Bills somehow acquire a really good cornerback, whether it's through a trade or signing. And I don't even think there's a guy who they could sign who would bump onto this list at this point, but. Mm-mm. Yeah, so I, I don't think there's any way that my list really changes. I did have some honorable mentions, just guys that I wanted to, and I, I've mentioned a couple of them already, but I think Gabriel Davis is a quiet honorable mention. Mm-hmm. I, I, I toyed with the him. idea of putting him at number 10 um, because having a young guy like him who performed as well as he did last year seems like he mm-hmm. really knows the ropes at this point. He could potentially break out and make our list look totally stupid for not having him on it. He has that type of potential, but as the wide receiver three, potentially wide receiver four, depending on what Emmanuel Sanders does, like he, that's a you never know type of situation. He he may eliminate the need for Emmanuel Sanders and John yeah. Brown type yeah. players. Like he he could he could just become that true number two. And he, the only reason he's a number two is because Stefan Diggs is there. Like he could become that elite guy going into year uh, going into year number two form, it's that extrinsic value of time that we're just waiting on uh, with Gabe Davis and that dev- in that development. I definitely debated putting him inside my top ten, but um, again, Cole Beasley. I, I just don't think you you serve. Yeah, I mean, Cole you, you Beasley can't put right it. Now. Yeah, yeah. Ed Oliver was another one that I really debated because I think he he's a guy who is very undervalued by the fan base because he didn't have a good year last year, quote unquote. And this he didn't have a good statistical year. But he played out of position, and I think when you get him in position, his value completely changes because he is more of that pass-rushing defensive tackle than a I'm going to be a fat guy run-stuffing defensive tackle. The other guy that I, was interesting that I'm not really sure where to to place him, but I, I think he needs to be mentioned is Mitch Morse because having a center who has a connection with the quarterback and he's as smart as he is – like. Having a, a center on the team who knows what they're doing, who can help with the the pre-snap adjustments, all of that, I think that's huge. But where he kind of fell off the list for me is that he's just he's not great in the running game. So 
If he was a mm-hmm. little bit better in the run game, he probably would have snuck onto my list because of everything else he does so well. But just that it was just enough for me where I had to keep him off the list. I think he's slightly overpaid as well for what we've gotten out of him. That's uh, fair. That would That's keep fair. him off the list for me as well. Um, you mentioned the run game woes, um, and you said he, he's got a connection. Well, he's also got a concussion. Like <laughs> you know, we got to be careful of, with, with of him. Those. Um, you know, it, thank God for having John Feliciano to be able to back him up. Um, you know, that's, that's one thing that, you know, I went on Rico's show last week or the week before, and we were debating the offensive line. That's, that's one place where we need to see improvement up the middle. Yeah. And it's going to yeah. start with Morse looking, looking out because he's got to get better in the run game. If, if we want production out of Singletary and Moss, that's that's where it's going to start is in that middle middle of the the offensive line in the trenches. Yeah. So okay. So here's a hypothetical now. Let's mm. say one of either Singletary or Moss has a really good year, like a thousand yard year. Okay. The line blocks really well. They do their like the running backs do their job. One of them has a, a really good year. Do they then make it on this list for you? Or do you value what the offensive line did more? And I, this is I, like we could have this hypothetical and yeah. then this discussion or argument, however it plays out this over is, and over and over again, and everybody's going to have a different take on it. But I think it's really interesting to see where people would value their production over other people's production for them. This this right here is the same argument as do you draft a running back in the first round or yeah. do you wait until the third, fourth, fifth round? It's the exact um, same, yeah. If 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 you have a thousand yard rusher this season from either Singletary or Moss, um, it's going to be one because the other one went down, and two the line the line started blocking really well, and that allowed the guy to heat up and get into yeah. that flow. I, I I think part of the two back system that we've been using hasn't allowed for that for the one guy to get hot. And to and to really showcase. Now, I've told people all along. I brought up the trade for Zach Ertz earlier. If uh, if it even does happen, Bills fans should be far more worried with the running game than they are with the tight end room. And the running game right now, uh, because we've seen the flashes from Moss and Singletary, both of them. We know what they can do. It is a schematic offensive line type problem. And so, yeah, I think I think you're right that it would be more on the offensive line than it would be either one of those guys really, really pulling a Derrick Henry type season. Yeah, well, yeah, I wouldn't expect him to pull a Derrick Henry type season. I was literally even just like a thousand yards. I think would be a shock to people at this point because like that would, like you said, it would it would probably take one of them getting injured. While you were while you were talking, I was trying to find. I was actually trying to find a statistic for you. But so you on the pat on the back. Okay. No, I was listening, but I was trying to find a statistic <laughs> because I, I think people, while they have not performed, while they did not perform last year to I think what expectations were, there was a stat that I saw where it was like over the last three years or four years, maybe even, who are the players that have the most broken tackles or something like that over the course of a season? And I was even surprised. I like both of them. I like Devin Singletary. I like Zach Moss. I like the potential for that kind of one-two dynamic that they have, even though they, they're not really speed guys. But they, I think mm-hmm. they have enough of a dynamic where they can make it work if the offensive line makes it work. They were both on the list. Alongside guys like Alvin Kamara, Derrick Henry, uh, Saquon Barkley, like top-tier mm-hmm. guys who had really, really good seasons. Devin Singletary in 2019 was on the list. Zach Moss, obviously, just from last year, from his rookie year, he was on the list, which was a a huge surprise, but they make guys miss. They break tackles. They're just doing it behind the line of scrimmage right now because they don't have any choice. I think we heard uh, leading up to the draft when we got Singletary is that that's what Brandon Bean was was looking at. When when we got all the the behind-the-scenes footage – he just said, I, I had so much fun watching Devin Singletary run. Um, I found the his, list. his value went up. 
Um, okay, give me the list. All right, so it wasn't just broken tackles. It was broken tackles per touch. So it, it's even like based off of how often you're getting the ball, how often you break a tackle. Derrick Henry, no surprise. He was number one on the list. 0.161 broken tackles per touch. Alvin Kamara, 2019, was on the list. Aaron Jones, 2019. Mike Davis from last year, he was on the list. It jumps all the way down to 1.43 at that point. Devin Singletary comes in at number 10. His 2019 season, 0.128 broken tackles per touch. That's number 10 over the last, I think that's three seasons. And number 12 is Zach Moss, 0.127. Like they're still making things happen. Like I said, it's just behind the line of scrimmage because they don't have any other choice. Right. So they yeah, can break that, those tackles like said, in front of the be, line of scrimmage. It's huge. It's game changer. That would be on the offensive line if we could get that running game going. I mean, we've seen, we've seen, like I said, we've seen the flashes. We've seen each guy break off big chunk plays. Um, <laughs> Devin Singletary breaking off the running rushing touchdown in Denver when he yeah. he should have just <laughs> he should have just went down. Um, oh, he, he needed gotta, those he, numbers. He needed those numbers. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Um, yeah, that that's a good list to, to be on. Um, yeah. Now we just need to secure the inside of the line, I think. Yeah. Um, Do you have, you have anything on. else? Yeah, I do, actually, All because right. uh, Star Lotulale returned to camp today. We are recording this on Tuesday. Yes. And uh, this will be released uh, coming up. But um, Sean McDermott did talk today about uh, Star coming back and – um, basically, Sean McDermott said, you know, Star's got a lot of work cut out for him. And I think people are just reading way too much into it. Um, you know, I saw one comment online that said uh, something like, this is a clear indication that he's not where the coaching staff wants him to be. Well, no shit, Sherlock, because it's <laughs> freaking June. Like, it's June. No one is where right. the coaching staff wants them to be, first and foremost. Second and second of all, like, every coaching staff wants every player to be perfect, so no player's ever, ever going to be where you want them to be. So um, not to mention that uh, it was very process-oriented for McDermott just to say he's got a lot of work to come out to him because Sean McDermott's the, – his style of coaching is to not go – open up his arms say we we missed you so much you're gonna save this team uh and and just heap praise on guys he does not do that sean mcdermott lets people know that they have work to do uh first and foremost it's going to be josh allen he's gonna let josh allen the best player on our team know that he has work to do so mm-hmm. it's no no different for a star low to Lille coming back yeah you have work to do and you probably have a little bit more because you have been off for a year. So people getting up in arms about Star Lotulale maybe not being where the coaching staff wants him to be. So what if it's a clear indication? Like it, it's a clear indication for everybody because it's freaking June. It, I, it's been very interesting over the course of literally just the last two weeks, I think at this point of, the fan base's reaction and very much generalizing there because it's not everybody, but then there's definitely been a reaction of, Oh, well, star's going to retire. He's not working right now. He's not working hard enough. He's, he's probably not going to be ready. And then there's a video that comes out of him working and people are like, Oh, he's working out too much. He's too skinny. He's not the way we want to be. We want to be a little fatter. We want to be bigger. Like this, this is no good. Why did you do all of that work? And now it, he's at, he wasn't, I think he wasn't at OTAs at first and people were freaking out about that. And then now people are going to freak out about these comments. Like water always finds its level. He's not going to be this skinny guy during the season. He's going to put on some weight. Is he going to be the perfect player? No, he's going to be Star no. Tule. He's going to be the guy who eats up a couple blocks, helps out other guys because he's where he's supposed to be and they're where they're supposed to be. But he's not going to make these big splash plays. That I think, I, I think, we're almost setting him up for failure in the fan base's eyes because there's been so much emphasis on, and I've done it. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a culprit oh, yeah. of this of there's like when star gets back, the defense is going to be totally different and it is going to be different. It's going to be a very different defense with him in the right spot and other guys in the right spot. 
but he still has to play well when he's there. He's not going to be 25, 26 year old star Latule. He, no. We have to temper expectations for him. And even with doing that, you can still acknowledge that the defense is going to look different, that other guys are going to be in better position to succeed. But let's not set him personally up for failure by expecting too much, or let's not expect nothing. Like he's he's going to have to, the first couple of weeks might be a little ugly for him, honestly. And that's okay. I was, I was just thinking, you say, let's expect nothing. I thought of Casey immediately. <laughs> I think I think when people say let's expect or when I say let's expect nothing, people just think of this podcast in general. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and you bring up people worried about their weight. You know, I've I I know personally here in Eastern Idaho, uh, an NFL defensive lineman who played uh, two years with Chip Kelly and the Eagles, and an offensive lineman who was drafted by the Buffalo Bills, Mark Asper. His parents live on the same road as my in-laws. I know Mark Asper personally, um, and they are both big guys, and they say, yeah, when you're not working out, you're going to lose weight. When you're not playing football, yeah. because offensive linemen and defensive linemen eat a massive amount of food, and there is plenty of time for Starlo Tulele to go heavy on the steaks and Little Debbie's. To put mm-hmm. that weight on, it does. It's not going to take very much for him to put that on because he's going to be working out. He's going to be motivated to eat. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I would not want to go out to a uh, five star steakhouse with an, a group of offensive defensive linemen. I would not want to see the amount of food that they put down in the middle of the season because it is a massive. Um, I actually think that Sports Illustrated maybe did an article where they, I think it was the Philadelphia Eagles offensive line. The, the, the writer took the, the five starting linemen for the Eagles after they won the Super Bowl out to dinner, and he just mm-hmm. was describing the amount of food. Like, each of them had three steaks plus ten sides and, like, five desserts apiece. Like, it is – people worrying about – again, it's June, his weight, there's plenty of time for him to hit the little Debbies going into the season. It's, it's fine, guys. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we, we touched on – a bunch of different topics that we didn't have planned. We didn't talk about almost anything beforehand at all, except for let's do this top 10 list. And we still hit the hour and 20 minute mark. Very impressive on our part. Very impressive. Hey, on our well, part. it must help you to have a, a, a guy co-host who can, can talk coherent sentences you know, <laughs> you can go a little bit longer. Makes we, things well, so, so th- this one, we normally go long, but it's usually because we get off topic a lot. We're very good at that. We get off topic and we don't always talk bills very often, but that's part of what we're good at is we are, we are entertaining. We're not going to be the most knowledgeable, but we will always entertain. That is one thing that we can promise. Well, I reached down into my bucket today for the first time in a long time. And I pulled out just for Casey. <laughs> And I'm so mad he's not here tonight. It is the the Cincinnati Bengals mini helmet from the mini helmet bucket of death that we did during the season. Mm-hmm. And again, just to sh- show my support for uh, whichever Tiger is lucky enough to get a meal inside the stadium when Casey decides to fight the Tiger. I think um, we're going to have to live stream it. Whenever we're able to make that happen, that might be years down the road because he's going to have to get permission from his wife. Um, but whenever that happens, I think we're going to have to live stream it. Yeah, well, you know what P- Carol Baskin says about her husband? He's a piece of shit now. So <laughs> I think that's what, that's what Casey's going to become a tighter stack at some point. And, and potentially. There's a, if, he keeps, if he keeps going down the path of trying to fight a tiger and convince people, eventually he's going to have to do it. Um, all right. That, yeah, I think that well, was a very the... interesting show. Yeah, I'm not expecting him to win that. Um, but – Jeff, I appreciate you being the stand-in co-host with me in Casey's absence. I, I think Casey's going to be back next week. We'll see. Um, but let's close this out, Jeff. Let me get a go, Bills. Go, Bills. Go, Bills. Perfect. <laughs>